Wow. VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the show, Gregory Stockel has a story about a Chinese movie that may affect Chinese tourism in Thailand. Faith Perlow brings us Ask a Teacher. She answers a question about source and resource. Faith will join me in the studio for a chat after her report. And we close the show with an American story. Today we hear Dr. Heidegger's Experiment by Nathaniel Hawthorne. But first, here's Gregory Stockel. A Chinese movie that shows scams in Southeast Asia could be frightening visitors from China from traveling to Thailand, researchers and data suggest. The movie No More Bets was released in August. It is about several Chinese citizens who are tricked into taking a work trip to an unnamed Southeast Asian country. Once they get there, the visitors are forced into operating illegal online investments, gambling, and digital money called cryptocurrency. The movie is based on a real-life problem that has increased in recent years. The same month the movie reached theaters, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights released a report on criminal groups. It said criminal groups have forced hundreds of thousands in Southeast Asia into illegal activities. In China, No More Bets made more than $500 million in the first month of its release. It became the top movie for three weeks in August, and it made the third most amount of money out of films this year. At one point in the movie, abducted Chinese travelers are traveling in a small vehicle, which drives under a road sign for Sukhumvit. It is a well-known area in the Thai capital of Bangkok. Experts say the film should not have a lasting effect on Chinese tourism to Thailand, but it has raised concerns that it could frighten tourists from traveling to Bangkok. Thailand is not the only country. Where the movie's success has caused concerns, Cambodia has banned its showing in the country because the Khmer language is shown in the film. And in Myanmar, the country's military administration said the movie hurts the country's image. Vincent Chuang used to work for the Rob Report. A publication about the good life, including travel. He still sees Thailand as a good place for Chinese tourists, but he admits bad news can easily keep away some possible visitors. I never think this will be a big problem. I have visited Thailand this year by myself. We know Southeast Asia has lots of interesting places, which fit for Chinese market, Chuang told VOA by email. The fact that No More Bets is based on true events 
means something to viewers as well, Chuang said. There is evidence that the movie may have already had some effect on Chinese tourists visiting Thailand, as arrivals are less than expected. There have been over 2.2 million mainland Chinese arrivals to Thailand this year through August, government data has found. But Thailand's tourism agency had predicted 5 million Chinese visitors by the end of 2023. That number seems unlikely to be reached by the end of next month. Other reasons must be considered, though. China has a slowing economy, and flights to Thailand are still not at pre-pandemic levels. In addition to that, a September shooting in Bangkok killed three people, including one Chinese national. Local media reported that 60,000 Chinese tourists canceled their trips to Thailand after the shooting. I'm Gregory Stockel. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Hi there. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between the word source and resource. Hello, friends. I'm Isaac, one of your followers from Mexico. I have a question. What is the difference between source and resource? Many thanks. Thanks for your question, Isaac. Both source and resource have similar word histories. One is the root of the other. That is the reason they look similar and might be confused. But these two words are quite different. Let's consider each one. Source can be a noun or a verb. As a noun, a source is the origin or beginning of something. For example, we often talk about the source of rivers. This source is where the river starts, like another body of water, such as a lake. The Nile River has two sources, the Blue Nile and the White Nile. A source can also be a person or something like a book or an article that supplies information. When you write an essay, you should write down your sources. A source can also be what something is made of. Red bugs, called conchineal, are the source for a red color used in dyes. Source can also be a verb. It can mean to find materials for something, or it can mean to provide something. The cook sourced ingredients for the dish from her own garden. Many jewelry companies source diamonds grown in a lab. Let's move on to resource. The word resource is a noun. It has many meanings. A resource is something that can be easily found and used quickly in a time of need. It can be a supply of something, support or aid. This kind of resource can include money, assets, or human power in case of emergencies. The United States supplies military resources to its allies in times of conflict. The International Red Cross and Red Crescent provide resources to people following natural disasters. 
A resource can also be something naturally found in the Earth's environment or underneath its surface. Natural resources include metals, oil, water, and even sunlight. And lastly, a resource can be something or someone that can help you get information or is an expert in a subject or industry. Her college advisor became a great resource to her when she was choosing her field of study. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Isaac. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. You just heard Faith Perlow present this week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back to the show, Faith. Thanks, Katie. You know, we are both journalists here at VOA. I am more of a teacher, but that got me thinking about how sources are important to our work and how when we write a story, we list our sources when we send our writing for review. It's true, Faith. The editor needs all the evidence you've gathered in support of everything you're saying in the story. How were sources important when you were teaching before in your career? Coming from an academic background, citing sources is extremely important. In grad school, I had to learn a new way to do this and eventually teach the methods of quotation and listing sources to my students. I was also the academic integrity officer for my department, so I handled a lot of plagiarism cases. Can you explain what plagiarism is, Faith? Plagiarism is using other people's words without acknowledging where you found the original information. In the United States, it is not acceptable to use others' ideas or words without their permission or without giving them credit. It's called intellectual property. We do not want to steal another person's property. So citing or listing sources is important to give the original author credit for information, quotes, and paraphrasing that you are using in your writing. By listing those original authors, it means that you've recognized their hard work. It also helps your reader to find that original information, which then can help them track down and find even more information. And it ultimately helps you to avoid plagiarism. Got it. Thank you for coming on the show, Faith. Of course, Katie. Today, we present the short story, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment, by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here is Barbara Klein with the story. That very unusual man, old Dr. Heidegger, once invited four friends to meet him in his office. There were three 
white-bearded gentleman, Mr. Medborn, Colonel Killigrew, and Mr. Gasquania. And there was a thin old lady whose husband had died, so she was called the Widow Wykerly. They were all sad old creatures who had been unfortunate in life. As a young man, Mr. Medborn had lost all his money in a badly planned business deal. Colonel Killigrew had wasted his best years and health enjoying the pleasures of women and drink. Mr. Gasquania was a ruined politician with an evil past. As for the widow Wykerly, tradition tells us that she was once a great beauty, but shocking stories about her past had led the people of the town to reject her, so she lived very much alone. It is worth stating that each of these three men were early lovers of the widow Wykerly, and they had once been on the point of killing each other over her. My dear old friends, said Dr. Heidegger, I would like your help in one of my little experiments. He motioned for them to sit down. Dr. Heidegger's office was a very strange place. The dark room was filled with books, cobwebs, and dust. An old mirror hanging between two bookcases was said to show the ghosts of all the doctor's dead patients. On another wall hung a painting of the young woman Dr. Heidegger was to have married long ago, but she died the night before their wedding after drinking one of the doctor's medicines. The most mysterious object in the room was a large book covered in black leather. It was said to be a book of magic. On the summer afternoon of our story, a black table stood in the middle of the room. On it was a beautiful cut glass vase. Four glasses were also on the table. Dr. Heidegger was known for his unusual experiments, but his four guests did not expect anything very interesting. The doctor picked up his black leather book of magic. From its pages, he removed a dried-up old rose. This rose, said the doctor, was given to me fifty-five years ago by Sylvia Ward, whose painting hangs on this wall. I was to wear it at our wedding. Would you think it possible that this ancient rose could ever bloom again? Nonsense, said the widow Wykerly with a toss of her head. You might as well ask if an old woman's lined face could ever bloom again. See, answered Dr. Heidegger. He reached for the vase and threw the dried rose into the water it contained. Soon, a change began to appear. The crushed and dried petals moved and slowly turned from brown to red, and there was the rose of half a century looking as fresh as when Sylvia Ward had first given it to her lover. That is a very pretty trick, said the doctor's friends. What is the secret? Did you ever hear of the Fountain of Youth? asked Dr. Heidegger. The Spanish explorer Ponce de Leon went in search of it centuries ago, but he was not looking in the right place. If I am rightly informed, the famous Fountain of Youth is in southern Florida. 
A friend of mine has sent me the water you see in the vase. The doctor filled the four glasses with water from the fountain of youth. The liquid produced little bubbles that rose up to the silvery surface. The old guests agreed to drink the water, although they did not believe in its power. Before you drink, my friends, the doctor said, you should draw up a few general rules as guidance before you pass a second time through the dangers of youth. You have had a lifetime of experience to direct you. Think what a shame it would be if the wisdom of your experiences did not act as a guide and teacher. The doctor's four friends answered him with a laugh. The idea that they would ever repeat the mistakes of their youth was very funny. Drink, then, said the doctor. I am happy that I have so well chosen the subjects of my experiment. They raised the glasses to their lips. If the liquid really was magical, it could not have been given to four human beings who needed it more. They seemed as though they had never known youth or pleasure. They looked like they had always been the weak, unhappy creatures who were bent over the doctor's table. They drank the water. There was an almost immediate improvement among the guests. A cheerful glow like sunshine brightened their faces. They looked at one another, imagining that some magic power had really started to smooth the lines on their faces. Quick, give us more of this wondrous water, they cried. We are younger but we are still too old. Patience, said Dr. Heidegger, who watched the experiment with scientific coolness. You have been a long time growing old. Surely you could wait half an hour to grow young. Again, he filled their glasses. The four guests drank the liquid in one swallow. As the liquid passed down their throats, it seemed to change their whole systems. Their eyes grew clear and bright. Their hair turned from silver to darker shades. My dear widow, you are lovely, cried Colonel Killigrew, who watched as the signs of age disappeared from her face. The widow ran to the mirror. The three men started to behave in such a way that proved the magic of the fountain of youth's water. Mr. Gascoigne's mind turned to political topics. He talked about nationalism and the rights of the people. He also told secrets softly to himself. All this time, Colonel Killigrew had been shouting out happy drinking songs while his eyes turned towards the curvy body of the widow Wykerly. Mr. Medbourne was adding dollars and cents to pay for a proposed project. It would supply the East Indies with ice by linking a team of whales to the polar icebergs. As for the widow Wykerly, she stood in front of the mirror, greeting her image as a friend she loved better than anything in the world. My dear old doctor, she cried, please give me another glass. The doctor had already filled the glasses again. It was now near sunset, and the room was darker than ever. 
but a moon-like light shined from within the vase. The doctor sat in his chair, watching. As the four guests drank their third glass of water, they were silenced by the expression on the doctor's mysterious face. The next moment, the exciting rush of young life shot through their blood. They were now at the happy height of youth. The endless cares, sadness, and diseases of age were remembered only as a troubled dream from which they had awoken. We are young, they cried. The guests were a group of happy youngsters, almost crazy with energy. They laughed at the old-fashioned clothing they wore. They shouted happily and jumped around the room. The widow Wykerly, if such a young lady could be called a widow, ran to the doctor's chair and asked him to dance. Please excuse me, answered the doctor quietly. My dancing days were over long ago. But these three young men would be happy to have such a lovely partner. The men began to argue violently about who would dance with her. They gathered around the widow, each grabbing for her. Yet by a strange trick owing to the darkness of the room, the tall mirror is said to have reflected the forms of three old gray men competing for a faded old woman. As the three fought for the woman's favor, they reached violently for each other's throats. In their struggle, they turned over the table. The vase broke into a thousand pieces. The water of youth flowed in a bright stream across the floor. The guests stood still. A strange coldness was slowly stealing over them all. They looked at Dr. Heidegger, who was holding his treasured rose. The flower was fading and drying up once more. The guests looked at each other and saw their looks changing back. Are we grown old again so soon? they cried. In truth, they had. The water of youth had powers that were only temporary. Yes, friends, you are old again, the doctor said. And the water of youth lies wasted on the ground. But even if it flowed in a river at my door, I still would not drink it. This is the lesson you have taught me. But the doctor's four friends had learned no such lesson. They decided at that moment to travel to Florida and drink morning, noon, and night from the Fountain of Youth. You have heard the American story, Dr. Heidegger's Experiment, by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Your storyteller was Barbara Klein. I'm Mario Ritter. Listen again next week for another American story. all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.